What if I told you that some people may have retained consciousness after being beheaded? That their eyes blinked, their mouths moved, and according to some accounts, they even blushed. It sounds like something out of a horror movie, but for centuries, eyewitnesses have claimed that victims of the guillotine and other executions showed signs of life after their heads were severed. The idea is disturbing, but could it actually be true? And was it worse to die by axe, by sword, or by guillotine? In this episode of History Calling, I'm going to discuss what historical records reveal about the final terrifying moments of the beheaded, and explain what science says about brain function after death, and whether consciousness can persist beyond decapitation. So if you've ever wondered what really happens in those final seconds, Stay with me for an answer which may be more complex and chilling than you think. Before I start, I just want to reassure you that there won't be any photographs or footage of deceased people in this video, though there are some drawings and paintings. I've tried to keep all my descriptions pretty clinical too, but still, if you have a delicate stomach, then this maybe isn't the video for you. And I would encourage you to instead check out one of my other episodes here on the channel. Execution by decapitation was a fairly common feature of early modern European societies, though it tended to be reserved for the elite, with the lower orders more likely to be killed by hanging or sometimes burning. For the nobility, at least in the British Isles and France, if they were sentenced to die by beheading, then death by axe or sword was the most common method of killing them until the mid to late 18th century, bearing in mind that this varied somewhat depending on exactly when and where you were. In the British Isles, one was more likely to die by the former instrument, as Queen Catherine Howard, Lady Jane Grey, Mary Queen of Scots and Charles I all did, in France, however, a sword was preferred, perhaps because it was thought to be quicker and more effective, with less likelihood of a botched death that required multiple blows. This wasn't always the case, however, as the experience of the half-Irish, half-French Thomas Arthur Comte de Lally showed. He suffered a horrific death in 1766, which required multiple sword strikes. Occasionally, this method of killing was transported across the English Channel too, most famously in the case of Anne Boleyn, who was executed, much more swiftly, by the swordsman of Calais within the Tower of London in 1536, and who was promised before her death that she wouldn't feel a thing, the blow would be so quick. This led her to make her famous remark that she had heard the executioner was very good, and in any case, she had only a little neck. In the 1790s, the French Revolution, with its so-called reign of terror, popularised another means of execution. A mechanism which would drop a blade from a considerable height and remove the need for someone to manually carry out the killing. This device had actually been around for centuries, and examples included the Halifax gibbet, which was in England, and the Scottish maiden. But thanks to the French, it is now best known as the guillotine. Touted as a quicker, more humane mode of death than previous options, it was meant to be painless for the victim and virtually immune to botching. It was also meant to be more egalitarian. In other words, everyone would now die in the same way, no matter their socio-economic background. The man it was named after, Dr. Joseph Ignace Guillotine, even told the National Assembly of France that with my machine, I'll have your head off in the blink of an eye, and you will suffer not at all. The National Assembly was convinced, and in 1792, they voted into law the use of what they called the most gentle of lethal methods. Was that true, though? In fact, were any of these methods of execution, even if they were carried out perfectly, actually painless for the victim, and did they cause instant death, or did the head remain alive for a few seconds after being separated from the body? Before I reveal what eyewitness reports from those who saw such executions have to say on the matter, just a quick reminder that if you're finding this video interesting, 
please do give it a thumbs up and leave a comment below, as this helps it to float to the top on YouTube so that other people can find it more easily. You can also get bonus material from me by becoming a YouTube member, or by joining me on Patreon, where I release extra content every week, including early access to ad-free videos and mini-podcasts. Those of you with Irish ancestry might also be interested in my book, Find Your Irish Ancestors Online, or for free bonus material, join the mailing list on my website and get two complimentary downloads right away, plus my newsletter. All the links you'll need are below. The accounts from the archives regarding execution by beheading are mixed, and some of them are truly disturbing. Mary, Queen of Scots, suffered a horrible death in 1587, as it took several blows of the axe to kill her, and she was heard to murmur in pain after the first. But even after the axe man was done, sawing her head off her body, yes, really, and was able to hold it up to the assembled crowd, it looked as though the Scottish Queen might not quite be done with the world, for one eyewitness described how her lips continued to move for 15 minutes after death. Fast forward to July 1793 and the French Revolution, and when Charlotte Corday, a 24-year-old woman who had murdered the revolutionary and Jacobin leader Jean-Paul Marais a month earlier by stabbing him in the bath, was then killed herself by guillotine, a contemporary wrote that the executioner held up her head and dared to slap it twice. The cheeks reddened in a manner that was striking to onlookers. The assumption was that Charlotte was still conscious, understood what had happened, and had blushed in indignation. The executioner, by the way, was prosecuted for this, as the guillotine was meant to simplify death and remove any torture or disrespect to the body. Other stories from 18th century France followed similar lines. One man swore that he saw the lips of a dead man move after decapitation. Others said that they saw supposedly deceased men stare or grimace when their exposed spinal cords were touched. Gross. Now, some of these stories are certainly untrue. No dead body, no matter the manner of death, will blush afterwards, as there's no blood flow. So we may take the story of what happened to Charlotte with a large pinch of salt. Other tales seem perfectly authentic, though, and the stories of such victims apparently displaying consciousness after death continued into the 20th century. In June 1905, in Paris... A Dr. Jacques Bureau witnessed the guillotining of a criminal and wrote the following detailed report of the seemingly astonishing sequence of events which followed. He said, Immediately after the decapitation, the eyelids and lips of the guillotined man worked in irregularly rhythmic contractions for about five or six seconds. This phenomenon has been remarked by all those finding themselves in the same conditions as myself for observing what happens after the severing of the neck. I waited for several seconds. The spasmodic movement ceased, then I called in a strong, sharp voice, Longuil, which was the name of the deceased, and I saw the eyelids slowly lift up without any spasmodic contractions. I insist advisedly on this peculiarity, but with an even movement, quite distinct and normal, such as happens in everyday life, with people awakened or torn from their thoughts. Next, Languille's eyes very definitely fixed themselves on mine, and the pupils focused themselves. I was not then dealing with the sort of vague, dull look without any expression that can be observed any day in dying people to whom one speaks. I was dealing with undeniably living eyes which were looking at me. After several seconds, the eyelids closed again. It was at that point that I called out again, and, once more, without any spasm, slowly, the eyelids lifted and undeniably living eyes fixed themselves on mine, with perhaps even more penetration than the first time. Then there was a further closing of the eyelids, but now less complete. I attempted the effect of a third call, there was no further movement, and the eyes took on the glazed look which they have in the dead. He wasn't the only one to report such things. In 1956, a chaplain at the Sante prison in Paris, Father de Voyard, reported that after the execution of a murderer, his head fell onto the trough in front of the guillotine, 
and the body was immediately put into the basket. But contrary to custom, the basket was closed before the head could be put in. The assistant carrying the head had to wait a moment until the basket was opened again. And during that brief space of time, we were able to see the two eyes of the condemned man fixed on us in a gaze of supplication, as if to ask our forgiveness. Instinctively, we traced a sign of the cross in order to bless the head, and then the eyelids blinked, the look in the eyes became gentle again, and then the gaze, which had remained expressive, was gone. As you might imagine, people who witnessed such things often found the whole experience deeply unsettling, but it is crucial to note that such events weren't a feature of all execution victims. For instance, nowhere in the primary source accounts of Anne Boleyn, Catherine Howard or Charles I's deaths, and I have episodes about all of them which I'll leave linked for you, do we hear of anything so gruesome. Though in cases like Anne's, where blindfolds were used, these would have hidden the eyes from view. They all died by sword or axe, but Queen Marie Antoinette of France was famously guillotined, and there is no record of post-mortem movement from her head either, though I do have an episode all about how her hair supposedly turned white the night before her death. Still, the fact that some heads seemed to retain awareness led to debate about the humaneness of decapitation, especially via the supposedly quick and painless guillotine. In 1795, a letter by a German anatomist named Samuel Thomas Summering was published in which he claimed that the guillotine was a terrible type of death, because the person remained conscious afterwards. Perhaps their body was no longer tortured after death, but now their minds and souls were. He called for its abandonment and a return to hanging. This set off a long debate, which has still not been resolved, as to when consciousness might fade from the deceased's head. One school of thought holds that any post-mortem movement was just down to muscle spasms and not consciousness, in much the same way as someone having a fit can be moving but not be aware of it and have no memory of it after they have recovered. This line of argument states that the force and shock of the impact, combined with the immediate stoppage to circulation, would render the victim insensible of any pain or awareness of their surroundings in an instant. After all, some people are knocked out by one blow to the head or neck and have no memory of what happened or of having suffered any pain when they come to. Why should execution victims be any different? Of course, the thing is that unlike with people who have been knocked out and recovered, we cannot ask a beheading victim to recount their experiences, and so we cannot know for sure that there was no pain or consciousness after the event, or that all such people had the same experiences. Perhaps some suffered and others did not. As well as witness reports from executions, there have also been gruesome experiments carried out on humans and other creatures to try to answer the question of whether consciousness was retained. In 1803, after seven criminals were guillotined in France, medical students picked up the heads and yelled at them to see if they would respond. They did not. However, there have been instances of butterflies and chickens being killed in this way over the centuries to see what would happen to them and where their heads or bodies did continue moving. In 1975 and 2013, experiments using EEG monitors on rat heads also found continued electrical activity in the brain for roughly 10 to 15 seconds after death, which has been interpreted by some as evidence of pain, though others dispute this. There have also been, and I kid you not here, attempted head transplants on dogs and mice starting in 1908, in which the transplanted heads lived for varying amounts of time, six months in the case of a mouse transplant in 2015. In short, to quote Matthew D. Turner, whose article on this topic was one of my sources for this video and is linked below for you, for every anecdote of consciousness in severed heads, no matter how nebulous or second-hand, there is a conflicting account of no retaining consciousness. The last person guillotined in France, and indeed in the Western world, 
was the 27-year-old Tunisian murderer Hamida Jan Duby, who was executed on the 10th of September 1977 for the brutal killing of a 21-year-old woman named Elizabeth Bousquet in 1974. Capital punishment was ultimately outlawed in France in 1981. Nowadays, only Saudi Arabia retains decapitation as an execution method, albeit using a sword, though they have occasionally admitted to the fact that this sometimes results in multiple blows being needed. It's difficult to say which was the worst way to go, but I'm going to say that it was the axe as it seems, based on the many cases of axe executions I've read about, to be the most likely to have gone wrong, followed by the sword, followed by the guillotine. Really though, they're all horrific and gruesome. As to whether those subjected to such violence retain consciousness afterwards, even just for a few seconds, despite the fact that some of them were undoubtedly very evil people who had done terrible things, the idea of staying awake after execution in this manner is so horrific that I still find myself sincerely hoping that they did not. However, it seems, based on everything that I've read, that it can't be ruled out, though it may not have happened to everyone who suffered this type of death. I hope, however, that it's not a question humans continue to try to get an answer to by subjecting any more living beings to this. As always, though, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on the topic. Do you think heads of execution victims continue to experience consciousness after being separated from their bodies, whether by axe, sword, or guillotine? Let me know below, and to learn more about the deaths of some of the people mentioned in this video, try one of these episodes next on the executions of Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard. Whatever you choose, please enjoy, if that's the right word, and until next time, keep learning.